everybody. Um, so my name is Melissa. Um, I'm from the Scottish Maritime Museum. Uh, I was employed there as the oral history project coordinator for about uh, 10 months of this year. Um, but I, in September of this year, I returned to university to do a master's degree. So I'm no longer employed there, but I've been given permission on behalf of the museum to talk about the project. So um, thank you very much for having me. And um, without further ado, we'll just get on to talk about the Working Voices Project, which was an oral history based community heritage project uh, delivered by the Scottish Maritime Museum. Um, so just to give you an idea about the scope of my presentation today, um, I'll go through some general introductions about the uh, organisations which were involved in delivering and directing the project, uh, then we'll discuss what exactly the project entailed and why oral history was chosen as the means through which to um, preserve community heritage and foster um, a sense of closer belonging to the physical landscape amongst the local community. Um, and then I'll talk about the tangible um, outputs from the project and finally the more abstract outcomes of the project because they are quite different. And along the way I thought I would show you a selection of the project's outputs as well. And then hopefully at the end, not going over time, we'll have time for questions. Uh, so the Scottish Maritime Museum, for those of you who aren't aware, is based in the west of Scotland with two sites, uh, one in Irvine and the other in Dumbarton. And the museum is founded on the historic and continuing importance of the sea to Scotland and it holds an important and nationally recognised collection which encompasses a real variety of uh, historic vessels, um, artefacts, really fascinating personal items and actually the largest collection of shipbuilding tools and machinery in the country. And as of the end of October, the outputs from the Working Voices project uh, have also been collated and developed into a permanent exhibition at the urban site, adding to this wonderful collection of Scottish maritime history. So the Working Voices project was delivered from our urban site, but it was also delivered in partnership with the Garnet Connections Landscape Partnership scene, which is a bit of a mouthful, so I'll just shorten that to Garnet Connections. Um, so the Garnet Connection Scheme has been supported through the Landscape Partnerships Grant Programme by the Heritage Lottery Fund, which of course um, tries to raise funds to uh, allow um, organisations to promote heritage in communities. And the Working Voices Project was one of 25 uh, projects that Garnet Connections has been working on with a range of local organisations in North Ayrshire since 2017. Uh, so what do I mean when I talk about the Garnet Connections area? Well, the area actually encompasses one of the largest scale valley landscapes in Ayrshire, and that runs from Lachlan right down to Urban Bay. And throughout history, the area has actually proved ideal for settlement and trade, and has a plethora of surviving cultural heritage and landscape assets today. And in particular, uh, the Garnet Valley has a really strong and fascinating maritime heritage. Uh, the Urban Harbour area, for example, was in previous decades a place bustling with the sounds of its vibrant local shipyards and the steady stream of ships which sailed in and out of its port on a daily basis. And the area also served as a training base for the Allied invasions in the Second World War. Further along the coast at Stevenson and Ardeer, we can see today the remnants of the old wharf which served the explosive factory that had been established in the area by um, Alfred Nobel himself in the 1870s and which evolved to become um, a major, if not the prime employer for locals along the Garnet Valley until it wound down in the late 1980s. The Saltcoats area was known principally as one of the prime uh, holiday destinations for families from Glasgow seeking uh, some fresh sea air. And the local harbour there, um, locals often sort of speak about it as a time when it was really busy with uh, trip boats taking tourists in and out around the bay on a daily basis. But today, um, as you can see in the second photo, its harbour um, has become rather disused and isn't used for those same purposes anymore. And uh, finally, the Ardrossan area, which is well known today as the ferry terminal for the Caledonian grain crossings to Campbelltown and Ardrossan, but this area was known in previous decades uh, for its profitable shipyard 
and there's an extremely important shipping and trading link. Uh, especially for the Shell Mex oil industry, which was established there in the 20th century. So all of this vibrant uh, maritime in industry in these towns along the Garnet Valley unfortunately really started to uh, wind down in the latter half of the 20th century for various different reasons. Um, but along with that came a great deal of economic decline and unemployment in these areas. Um, and all the physical structures like the harbours and the wharves and the factories that I've been talking about still remain. Uh, it was kind of, these are reminders of this industrial past, but it was identified that the sense of connection with or understanding of the importance of these heritage assets amongst locals was declining. And that's particularly true for younger generations, such as mine, who never lived through this period of time uh, when maritime industry along the valley was at its peak. Um, and that kind of lack of understanding or engagement with these assets was really down to a lack of opportunity to engage with them, whether that be through um, organised groups or kind of information and interpretation displays. And it was also identified quite early on in the Garnet Connections discussions that this intimate knowledge of uh, this heritage and this history was at risk of being lost to time and an aging population, and this is what the Working Voices Project really sought to address. Uh, so it was decided that um, the most effective way to preserve information about this vanishing industrial past would be to record the working lives and memories of those who are employed in it. Um, oral history is a really fantastic way of recording community history and heritage. Um, it actually emerged in the 1960s along with uh, labour history as a way of incorporating uh, people whose, whose voices might not otherwise have been heard in traditional written history into the historical record. And its efficacy for community-based projects, I think, really rests in the way um, in which it allows local communities to regain a sense of agency over the way that their history and their past is communicated. Um, and it moves beyond traditional ways of recording cultural heritage by recognising that the relationship between heritage and community shouldn't be one-sided, but rather a series of exchanges between information and interpretation. And projects such as these get locals a sense of shared ownership over the project, as well as involvement in the local community. And I'll talk about those wellbeing aspects a little bit later in the presentation. I think also for oral history, the use of personal testimony, hearing people's voices, seeing their faces and their whole range of human emotions um, that they express as they recall memories, gives the immediate landscape and the environment that they're talking about much more of a vivid, vivid historical dimension um, than written history ever can. So recruiting participants for the project um, proved somewhat challenging as unfortunately a lot of the people who have been employed in these industries were no longer uh, living. So we broadened this to encompass people whose family members um, had worked in the industries and who maybe had stories passed down from them that they wanted to share. Uh, we used various media outlets to broadcast about the project and recruit participants and we found that social media pages and local forum pages within social media proved to be really the most effective way of getting locals involved. Um, we had set a minimum aim of 15 participants and we were able to interview 20 people in the end of the project. And the interviews either took place at the urban site or I travelled out to people's homes to interview them there if they weren't able to come to us. So the 20 oral histories that were collected over the course of the project have been archived for posterity at the Scottish Maritime Museum and they will be made publicly accessible in the future. Um, I was getting quite a lot of free, like, free reign with how I wanted to kind of develop the project and exhibit it um, to the public. And I reflected a lot on what uh, exhibits I found most engaging whenever I went to museums or heritage sites. And I visited a lot in my childhood and I found that the exhibits I found most engaging were ones that used a lot of audio visual output. Um, and since we were kind of targeting a lot of younger generations, 
and um, we kind of decided that that would be the best avenue to display um, outputs through. So I selected short anecdotes and stories from the interviews and then developed them into short two to three minute long videos which have been included in the exhibition at the urban site. And these were also shared online and have gained a lot of traction on the museum's YouTube page. Um, they've proven extremely popular with a range of local people uh, and have undoubtedly, I believe, raised awareness um, amongst the community of the value of their local heritage throughout history. Um, many of the people interacting with these um, outputs online have never engaged with heritage projects or establishments before but have indicated that they would really like to come along to the exhibition at the museum site. And the museums, uh, sorry, the videos have also proven popular with people who grew up in the area but emigrated to other countries in later years, um, with a lot of people expressing that they now feel more connected with their local heritage, even though they aren't able to physically visit the area often, um, having been able to access these projects online. Um, the videos are also going to be used for uh, the Garnet Connections Online Heritage Archive, which will link them to a new mobile app, and users of the app will be able to listen to these oral histories on an interactive map of the Garnet Valley area when they're out and about exploring heritage trails. And a final core output of the project was the delivery of oral history training to local groups and individuals who wanted to organise their own oral history projects. Um, and I think that's been really fantastic to see the development of new skills amongst people and um, sort of furthering the celebration and preservation of other aspects of um, heritage in the area beyond the maritime industry. But the Working Voices Project has also produced benefits beyond preserving previously undocumented heritage. And several of the project participants have expressed a sense of gratitude for the opportunity to give back to their community and make their own personal contribution upon the preservation of local heritage. Um, I'd like to show you a video from one of the project participants' interviews. Uh, this man actually came all the way down from Western Ross to Urban to participate, and his family had immigrated from Campbelltown in 1915 to Urban when the shipyard at Urban had just taken on massive orders for the First World War. And mostly every single man in his family had worked in some sort of maritime trade. And he broke the chain and became a teacher, but he always felt a deep sense of connection to the sea. And after suffering uh, from an attack of the Benz in a diving accident, he decided that he wanted somehow to record the vivid memories um, that he had of the local urban area, and especially its maritime heritage. Um, and luckily for him, he had just started the project. But I think he really represented what the project sought to achieve um, and the themes of this conference today, actually, in that he was so passionate about communicating just how the area and the physical landscape and the coastal heritage had shaped the person that he later became in life. Okay. So in this clip, he recalls a story passed down to him from his uncles about his great-grandfather's encounter with a foreman at the shipyard in Irvin. When my grandfather worked in the shipyard and his father before him, my great-grandfather is, was working as a rigger and the foreman was castigating the men for taking too long to do a job mm -hmm. and my great-grandfather apparently said to him, the job has to be done properly. If we don't tension the rigging correctly, then the mast is likely to fail, particularly with the strain on the derricks. We have to do the job properly. Mm -hmm. And it takes time to get the tension just right. And of course the foreman's attitude was, you need to get on to the next job. You're taking too long, just get a so-and-so job done. And my great-grandfather was actually quite a devout man. He was quite religious, religious. And he quietly suggested that he really didn't need to use foul language. And the foreman turned on him and started poking the chest, I'll use any kind of language I like. 
And as he started doing that, that just triggered an explosion. And my great grandfather just lifted his fist and right up an uppercut under the chin and stretched him out in the deck of the ship. And after that, he was never a problem. Mm. And he kept a civil tongue in his head. And I remember my uncle telling me, he said, I said, my father was here. And he said, <laughs> he couldn't believe it because he'd been a very gentle man. He was religious and never raised his voice in anger. And then all of a sudden, this guy boom, started prodding him in the chest and the fist came up and laid him low. Interesting subjects were predominantly made up of elderly individuals who also expressed gratitude in being able to meet and talk to new people whilst also getting to reminisce about old friends and family and happy memories. So oral history projects like this one really do have a capacity to connect people and reduce social isolation amongst vulnerable groups within society. Uh, the next video I'd also like to show you is from an interview that was conducted with a gentleman whose family owned a ship grocers and well, it was a grocery shop and a ship chandlery on Urban Harbour's frontage. And uh, while he sort of delivered the groceries to these various ships that came into port, he developed quite, um, quite a few friendships with some of the crews on board the ships, in particular one of the chartered explosive vessels, uh, the SS Florence Cook. And Mr. Sims had recently retired and he was kind of looking for things to do in all this free time that he had and he started to pick up an old hobby of his which was writing folk music. And he decided to piece together um, some of the stories that he had been told from crew members on board the SS Florence Cook into a kind of tribute to the vessel and sort of what it meant to him through his life. So in this clip, you'll hear one of the stories from his childhood working for the family business, as well as a song that he composed about the Florence Cook. The shop itself was was a little bit more than just a grocer, grocery shop. It, it, it served the shipping. We got to know a lot of the, the crews, the Florence Cook docked on the Irvin side. I, I was on board the ship a lot uh, I was, because I loved ships, you know, and I was that age, I was about, I was about 14, 13, 14, and my dog went everywhere with me and we two years used to go on the ship. And um, the, the cook had said to him, right, well, yeah, one day he'd said to him, right, you're going to have dinner with the captain. And I thought, oh, that's wonderful, you know. So every, it was a, every second Sunday, I would have dinner at the captain's table, you know. So I got to know them really well. And I was always on board it. And uh, that particular time you're talking about, um, I'd gone down to the galley, which I could do all that time. I used to just go in and help myself to a big pot of tea, you know, and, and condensed milk. And I was just sitting down because the ship was beginning to move. And sometimes they did that. They, they moved it from one part of the wharf up to another part, you know, to get to the crane. I didn't think very much about it. I said, oh, we must be moving. And was always one, don't get on deck before moving, you know. So I just stayed down there. And uh, it must have been about 45 minutes after that. Cook came down and he said, what are you doing here? <laughs> We've gone to Ireland. <laughs> so I was over the bar. I was on my way, you know, and oh, there was pandemonium, you know, and then the captain came on to know. He said, oh my God. So eventually they, they telephoned the police, or the, the radio, the police, and the police got phoned a shop, told my mum and dad, and they said, better just leave him where he is, it's, it'll be safe enough. You know? So I had a nice little cruise to, to Ireland, me and the dog, and then we get shipped back and I didn't sit down for a week. When I sailed with Sean McLeod We sailed out on the morning tide To the tune of the crowd The farmer's cook was newly laid Straight out of Geordie's dog We were loaded low with iron and coal We sailed for Port Madog When the blows rain 
Christmas long. We will not be back home again until the maybirds grow. Until the maybirds grow. run through these last couple of points, but um, other participants also spoken about the cathartic process behind talking about and remembering important people in the community um, who unfortunately have passed away in recent years and um, the process of sort of paying tribute to their lives and memories and how much they valued the opportunity to do that through this project. Um, we also found that in the recruitment stages, sharing information about the project on social media alone really helped to stimulate conversation and narratives about the marketing and heritage of the area and actually reconnect people who had worked together in these industries but had lost touch over the years. And many of the project participants also formed new connections from the project. And people who otherwise may never have met were able to connect with each other because of shared experiences and fondness for the local environment, which had so profoundly shaped the course of our lives. And um, so if I have time, I'd like to show just one more video uh, from an interview with a gentleman whose father was a captain on board one of the chartered explosive vessels and later became Ireland's harbour master. And uh, I found that about six different interviewees all had connections to Mr Mackay's father. And he had actually given most of them their first jobs in life. Um, so it was really fantastic uh, at the museum's exhibition opening to see Mr Mackay meeting all of these different people. Um, and sort of, they all had such lovely memories of his father to share about working with him. Uh, so this clip is about him talking about his father's time on board the Lady McGowan. But then there was the, the one occasion where they had to, to they went uh, on a six month trip which uh, took them to Calcutta mm. and ports in between. Uh, so that was quite a, a, you know, seemed quite a daunting prospect for a vessel of that size, the Lady McGowan as it was, uh, to, to be going that kind of distance, you know, and uh, they visited Cyprus, as, as far as I can remember, Cyprus, uh, Aden and, uh, and, and Calcutta. I mean, I'm sure there was other places. There seems to be something that I remember that uh, they, I, th I think oh, I seem to have this in my mind about Zanzibar for some particular mm. reason, but they, there was an island in the Indian Ocean that they, they had to visit. Uh, and again, with technology and what have you, uh, in those days, it was difficult to know exactly where you were and where it was you were actually meant to be going and apparently no one on the ship spoke very good French and nobody on the island spoke very good very good English. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a bit of a, a carry on getting the right port mm -hmm. and the uh, and the, the pilot and whatever to uh, to get alongside. But of course, as it all turns out, everything was was fine in the end, mm. but uh, but that whole trip, I mean, going to India on a ship, that's it. They, they were also uh, caught in a cyclone at some point, so Gosh. that that was quite uh, sort of daunting for them. Mm. Uh, but uh, but obviously survived that all right. Mm. You know. Well, um, I'm going to talk about the content I have to show you today. So thank you very much for uh, listening. <laughs>